back to All Over the Place, the official podcast of Media Pub Live. I'm your host, Eric Provosnik. We'll come well, back. We'll he may have after. lost it, but I'm here. <laughs> Christine Leninger, always with us as well. Hello, Christine. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and unfortunately, tonight, Mar- Marty Zamora, our other co host, could not be with us tonight. Some personal matters came up with him. So, we're gonna we're gonna you know, trudge along and, and uh, Jim Jim are you back uh, audio wise with us now? Yeah, I appear to be. I'm having a lot of issues with with freezing up though. Okay. I, uh, can, my can connection. We blame, so I don't, I don't know what's wanna, going on, but I don't want to blame our last guest when, when he had that Eric Cartman freeze. But we'll we'll just leave that one alone. I think things will remedy themselves. They always do around here. Because with us tonight, I trust. We're we're, we're, we're going to keep pushing through because with us tonight, we have a rock and roll legend, a founding member of the band Blue Oyster Cult. He's uh, also a a member of the Dictators. And right now he's got some solo project stuff going on. Please welcome to the show, Albert Bouchard. Albert, welcome to All Over the Place. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And I mentioned, you know, the solo stuff and you've got to actually it's the uh, the end of a trilogy you've been working on. Started yeah. out with Imaginos, which came about, you know, has been gestating for years and actually came to fruition with BOC back in the day. And then you came back in 2020 and did Reimaginos, then Imaginos 2, the bombs over Germany. And now released uh, recently, we have Imaginos 3, the mutant reformation. So tell us all about how the trilogy came about. And okay, finally, so- what's that? And how it came about, and now it's reached its fruition. Yes, yes. So uh, this was an idea that uh, when, uh, well, first of all, let's let's back up a little bit. So Imaginos was a concept that Sandy Perlman, who was our manager uh, and uh, co uh, co producer of all of most of our records, I think all but two, and uh, and my my friend, you know, he was like my mentor. And, and, um, so it's, so he, uh, he, when I met him in 1967, okay. I was uh, 20 years old and I'd moved to New York city to make my fortune as a, a musician or to at least become a professional musician. And I met Sandy and, uh, within a couple of weeks, he had told us the story about this Imaginos character. And, and I was like, Oh, well, that's really wild. You know, at the time I thought he was going to write a book, you know, or something. He, he'd talk about these other books like Giles Goat Boy or, you know, uh, you know, the HP Lovecraft novels, you know, which I hadn't really read that much of. So uh, he was always talking about books. So I thought he was going to write a book about it, but you know, it turned out that he was really thinking about music that was going to go along with this and lyrics and stuff. So, you know, I didn't realize that he had, uh, had, uh, 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 ambitions to be a songwriter. I didn't realize that. So I, I just knew that he was into music. He wrote for Crawdaddy magazine and, uh, you know, which was the first rock, the first like sort of serious rock, uh, magazine before Rolling Stone, before Cream, before any of these things. It was kind of the first one. And uh, so uh, he was writing for that magazine. So I knew him as a writer and uh, uh, he, you know, he had some money. So he was kind of helping the, the group out with, uh, you know, financial support and he wanted to be our manager. That's what he said. So I thought that's okay. But then within uh six months he had started bringing lyrics over to the band house we had a band house in saint james you know that sandy and and the other co-founder the co-founder of the band john wiesenthal uh, who is now a professor at uh, eastman school of music in rochester new york but anyway john was the other guy that started the band and they had kind of got the band house so he started bringing these lyrics over and uh one of the songs that he brought over well this was a little later we we i started writing songs i had written a bunch of songs i had one called um you was just called you and it went like you never meant nobody no harm you know 
And so it was like that, but it was really, that was sarcastic because it was about the, it was about the government. It was about mm -hmm. the American government. And it, at the time, Vietnam was going on. And, uh, you know, by the time I wrote that, my best friend had been killed over there. You know, it was several other of my classmates that were killed in Vietnam. So, and I come from a very small town, you know, there was only 22 boys in my, my, uh, my class. And so within a couple of years, three of them were gone, you know, and from Vietnam, you know. And so, I mean, people die of all, you know, some, you know, now there's a lot of them are gone, you know, but anyway, so I wrote that and Sandy said, you know, I like this song. I like the idea of the song, but I don't, the lyrics are, you know, a little generic. And I said, you're absolutely right. I mean, I want, I'm really at this point, at that point in my life, I was really feeling like, I did not want to be like another songwriter. I, I didn't want to write songs that were just like every other song. As a matter of fact, I wanted to write stuff that was completely different. And I, and because I felt like I could never make it, you know, it's just, you know, has it been done this well? You know, I didn't even have, I didn't have that much faith in myself. I really thought I had to be uh, odd and unusual to get any kind of attention, which, you know, who knows, <laughs> whatever it was, it worked eventually. <laughs> But so, so he had this idea and eventually, you know, by the time we were auditioning for Clive Davis, uh, he had given us this song called Blue Oyster Cult. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to do it because it was just too many words. It was just like, you know, uh, I think five verses and they were longer than a Bob Dylan song. It was like, it was ridiculous. So, uh, we didn't do it, but when it came time to pick a, uh, a, uh, a name for the band he decided that we should well him him and the other co-producer murray krugman they both decided that we should be called blue oyster cult and we're like oh no that's terrible you know you named us after your song and we don't even we're not even going to play that song so uh but anyway we became blue oyster cult and uh so uh, this was started back then. Flash forward to 1981 when I was asked to leave the group and Sandy said, don't worry. You know, he was he was very upset at first, but he, then he, I got an idea, Albert. I'm going to get you a solo deal with Columbia. They're interested, you know, and, uh, you know, give me give me copies of your your demos for for the songs, because I'd already demoed up almost all the songs for the first uh, Imagine Us record. I had, you know, well, Sandy and I, we'd been working on them since, I guess we started in 74. We start, you know, right around, you know, when we're starting to work on the Agents of Fortune stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, I was sitting in my apartment at the time I lived in the East Village on uh, 10th Street between A and B in New York and Alphabet City, they call it. And, uh, and, uh, uh, I, I worked up the song called Imaginos and, uh, and I get a phone call. It's Don Roser, Buck Dharma and said, Al, I got this great riff and he plays me. Don't fear the reaper. And I'm like, wow, that's really great, man. That's, you know, we're going to have a great record. He said, what are you doing? I said, I, I just got this other great song. It sounds kind of like your song. It's called Imaginos. <laughs> and I played it for him and you know of course uh, he's like yeah Al, that's great you know but we we ended up not doing that song I think we, basically because Sandy really wanted it to be of a piece he wanted the band to do the whole record at once you know and uh, they resisted they you know when when Eric wrote the lyrics for Blue Eyes to Cult they decided they didn't want to call it Blue Eyes to Cult so they called it Subhuman you know but it was also, it wasn't exact. I mean, Sandy wasn't great. He was great that he got credit for writing a song, but he, he you know, uh, he felt uh, bad that Eric didn't use all the lyrics. You know, the same thing happened with uh, uh, astronomy where Joe wrote astronomy and then, and then Eric said, I mean, Sandy said, uh, I don't like it. You're not using enough of the lyrics. The song, the story isn't even there. I mean, there's no story. You know, it's just it was this clock strike twelve, moon drops burst out of your hiding place. You know, mass in oil and madman place. 
you know, that first verse, that's all it was. And uh, so there was a whole bunch of other lyrics. So uh, we didn't do that for, for tyranny and mutation, but the time, by the time we got the secret treaties, I had already created this other, this other music, the middle section and the ending and all of that. So, you know, and I put that on there using almost all of Sandy's lyrics and uh, Sandy was happy and the band was happy. Joe was happy. So, you know, we did that. We did it at that point, you know, but so that's where it started. So I got the, the record deal and San, and I said, well, Sandy, what are we going to do? You know, it, this is our masterpiece here. I mean, this is, re it was really coming out great. And I said, you know, this is, we're going to make a mark with this one. You know, he said, I agree. You know, I said, but what happens when it's a big success? What are we going to do? He said, well, we have to do the next one, which is going to be bombs over Germany. I said, you mean the one with half lifetime? He's like, yeah. And I said, but isn't half lifetime like the earth gets destroyed? Isn't that going to be the end of it? He goes, no, no, no. The next one is going to be mutant reformation where what happens when humans are gone? <laughs> so that's essentially what this this uh this current record is you know so that's how it came about all coming together over just yeah all, everything leading all the all the paths lead, lead to where, where you wanted with it so and it's you know, and, and unfortunately you know S sandy uh passed away before you know i could could see the, yeah. the culmination of everything so yeah. as you were making it uh just how how much were you keeping in mind just you know your your lifelong friend and being able to just get this you know um, sounding as great as it could be in, in in his honor? I thought about it every every minute that I was working on it. I, I had to tell you that uh, he had an accident in Christmas around just after Christmas in uh, 2015, and he was in a coma. And uh, his friend uh, Robert Duncan was he you know brought him well he didn't bring he somebody found him they brought him to a hospital and then robert was going and making sure that they're taking care of him and whatnot and i said to robert if sandy comes out of the coma i want to go i want to go and see him i haven't seen him in 10 years and i i i mean if he's not going to make it and he's awake there are things i want to tell him i wanted to tell him First of all, I wanted to say I was sorry that I sued him, that that, you know, it was it was I didn't want to do it. But, you know, the lawyer had talked me into it and said that you, these guys are screwing you. This is all about like when Imaginos came out as a Blue to Cult record instead of my record. OK, so and I kind of went along with it, except that. My stipulation was that they shouldn't put it out as a Blue Oyster Cult record unless I'm actually back in Blue Oyster Cult, which Sandy told me that was going to happen. And the other the other people in the management told me that. And then after it came out, the band said, no, we never agreed to that. They didn't say anything that you had to be back in the band. And, you know, we, we don't want you back in the band. So So I sued him. And uh, and I felt bad about that because I it didn't. Well, all of it, it might have made a difference down the line somewhere where some money was involved and they decided they better, you know, not try and cheat me or something. I don't know. I don't know if it was it did any good. It didn't certainly didn't help the record sell or anything. The record basically bombed and uh, it was, you know, pretty sad for all of us. So anyway, I wanted to apologize. And, and I also wanted to tell him how grateful I am for everything that he'd done and, and how much he meant to me as a person. And, you know, uh, you know, just what a great influence he was. So he did come out of the coma and I went to the hospital. I spent two days in San Francisco with him in the hospital. I mean, I didn't sleep there. They made mm -hmm. me leave when it was time to when visiting hours were over, but then I would come back the next day at 10 o'clock in the morning and I would stay until eight at night. So uh, I spent a lot of time with him. He could not talk. He could uh, he could move, I think his left hand. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. And and uh, and uh, when I when I told him I loved him, he started crying. So I knew he I knew he understood me. 
You know, I'd never said that before to him. I mean, you know, we had a working relation, you know, guys, you know. Sure. I never, I never sure. said that. So I, I wanted to tell him. I wanted to tell him because I thought it was important. And But also I told him, you know, Sandy, I'm going to do this record the way that you wanted to do it. You know, when we were doing it in the studio, I used to argue about it. You know, he'd say, I want to do this and that. I'd say, it's, you know, I wanted this to be my my launching pad to my solo career. So I wanted it to be a full band thing. I wanted all these guys. I wanted it to be bombastic and like heavy metal. And, you know, because that was coming up that I could, feel, you know, I could tell that, you know, music was getting heavier. I wanted it to be as heavy as possible. And he's like, what well, these are like, these could be like folk songs, you know? And so... So I told him, I'm going to do it the way you wanted this time. And so, so then he died. And I don't know if you've lost anybody that's close to you, but for me, I couldn't deal with it. It was like, ugh, screw it. It's over now. You know, he's gone. I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it, you know? And then four, four, years go by five years go by and i'm thinking i told him i would do it and you know i mean it does you know it doesn't mean anything to anybody but me but i want to do it i want to you know i said i would do it and i'm pretty i i try to live my life with integrity and and i thought i can't really look at myself unless i do this because i have i have people that can help me i have the equipment i have the knowledge i have everything that i need to do it so i'm gonna do it and so yeah yeah i thought about it every second for the for all three records about how would sandy want to do it and across the three records and especially going with the first one the re imaginos uh you, definitely able to get more of that folk flavor more of an acoustic thing to it. and then over the course of the next two records i mean it's every style imaginable on that one so it, it, it just it's a great closure and i love how you were able to you know for boc just has this amazing catalog you know, so rich and interweaving all those songs whether in you know different takes on it just like lowering the key here just take, doing a little different instrumentation there mm -hmm. And what was it like for you being able to take that the, the rich tapestry of songs and just interweave through the, these new songs? It was it was it was fun. You know, I felt a little um, nervous about it because a lot of times when people redo the songs that made them popular in the first place, people go, "Oh my God, that's yeah, oh, it's just it's sad." You know, it's like this is so lame. You know, oh, he's doing it so slow, and you know. <laughs> You know, it's like the Beach Boys doing hot fun in the summertime. You know, it's like, it's good, but no, it's terrible. <laughs> hot fun in the summertime, you know, <laughs> you know, so. Times yeah. change, people. Things change. Deal with it. You can listen to the old ones if you want. <laughs> but, but I haven't gotten that feedback. I mean, the worst that anybody has said is that it doesn't rock quite as hard as the originals. And I think that most of them don't do that although that was not the point for those songs and but if you look at a song like transmaniacon come on that's the dictators man it I guess you throw the dictators in on that one that that song still kicks you where it needs to kick you it kicks you right there yeah <laughs> it's great you know i i Lester Bangs, uh, when the first record came out we, we we're all good friends you know and Lester Bangs said uh sandy what kind of song is this transmaniac on? This is a ridiculous song. No self-respecting biker would ever sing along with to clear the road, my bully boys. <laughs> but when Keith Ross sings it, it sounds like something you want to, it sounds like a real biker would sing it, you know? So, yeah, I love, I love some of the things came out really great. And I think that even the ones that didn't rock as hard as Blue Icicle came out just as good, but in a different way. I like it. I, I, I'm of the mindset, you know, I, I don't like to hear the song the same way twice or very, very few yeah. times. So I, I, I like the way Talking Heads mix stuff up. I like the way the replacements sing different or Westerberg sings things differently. Yeah. But it, it's again, if I want to listen to the original, I can always listen to the original. If yeah. I like something new, the well, a different twist that an artist has done, I may like it, I might not. Melon mm -hmm. Camp's been doing that in recent years too. I, I, 
I dig it a lot. So I just try something different. And yeah. uh, also on, on uh, the third album on uh, Mutant Reformation, if I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think you were uh, 37 different people contributed yeah. to the album. A and lot, you're, yeah. You were able to bring a lot of the guys from Blue Oyster Cult coming back in, your brother. And yeah. tell, tell, tell us about, you know, just reunions and, and just the, the vibe that you got from playing with all these people that you've been with your whole life. It, you know, it was really great. It was really great. You know, uh, I, I, uh, before I did it, after, after I did the last one, Bombs Over Germany, which I liked, and I had, I brought in Richie Castellano, played some guitar, and I had uh, some other people that, that helped me. And I thought, this one, I really wanted to get more people. I wanted to have more songs. I wanted to have more, more variety of, of the sounds and the, and the styles. And, um, <clears throat> and I also wanted to have some of the songs be live in the studio. So, uh, so that's, you know, so Joe helped me out with that because he, he came and played keyboards and helped arrange uh, some of the songs when we went into the studio and we cut uh, six songs live. So that was great as well, you know, so uh, it was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to have Mike Watt sing on it, you know, and, and I felt like Sandy, eh, when I met Sandy, his best friend was Richard Meltzer. And for some reason, and I, you you never know why people fall out of, uh, of favor with each other, but for some reason, the last 10 years or so of Sandy's life, Richard and Sandy did not get along. You know, he was like, I can't, I couldn't even talk to him about Sandy. So when I was doing this, I thought, I really want to get a Richard Meltzer song on there. And this, he wrote this one song, Curse of the Hidden Mirrors, which I believe was kind of like referencing Sandy's. I could be wrong about this, but he, I believe he was referencing Sandy's whole thing, obsession with the mirror as being the agent of e evil, you know? So Richard wrote Curse of the Hidden Mirrors, like, well, just throw them away then, you know? Put them, put them in the closet where you won't never see them or something. So I thought, oh, that's a great idea for Imaginos to, to find redemption. You know, from, you know, so because he wants to be redeemed because at the original, you know, I thought, oh, redeemed, you know, it's uh, it's supposed to be Sir Rastus Bear, which was really David Roder's dog that chewed up Sandy's car. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, David Roder put his St. Bernard in Sandy's little mini, mini Cooper. <laughs> and the dog ate ate the the upholstery ate ate the seats oh my god so yeah <laughs> so that's originally what it was about but uh, i have all this in the closet back there i have all of sandy's writings or most of them a great deal of them a, a thousand pages of of sandy's uh, lyrics and a lot of he would write many different versions of the lyrics and so imagine us was in that redeemed uh, original redeemed. He had actually put Imaginus, and I'm like, wow. I, you know, I was just kind of making this up, but Sandy, Sandy was thinking about that. So, I, so I talked to Richard. I said, is it okay? I'm going to change the lyrics a little bit to fit with the story. So it's a, it interfaces with Mountain of Madness, which is a song that I wrote with Richie, and a song that that uh, Sandy had encouraged me to write back in 1974. And, and actually, I did write the song. I wrote the song, and I had written, you know, I didn't have any lyrics. I didn't know what the, I said, well, I'll write some music, and you write the lyrics to Mountain of Madness. And so I wrote this music, and Sandy said, uh, no, Albert, this is not, I can't use this. This is not what I had in mind at all. He said, it's a nice song, but, you know, it's not. So I decided, well, I'm going to write, I'm going to write it again. I'm going to revisit the H.P. Lovecraft uh, story, you know, the, the, the at the Mountains of Madness, about this excursion to Antarctica and all of that, you know. So <clears throat> I did that, and then uh, and I told uh, and I wrote a song, and I was like, ah, it's still terrible. I, you know, it's I like the idea. I think I'm much closer. I'm getting closer to what Sandy wanted, but. I need, it's just not, it's dull. 
And so I, I called up Richie Castellano. I said, Richie, can you help me with this? And he said, yeah. Oh, this is a great idea. He said, I love that story. So he already knew the story. And, and we started for, for about two weeks. We went back and forth with the lyrics, 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 lyrics. And finally, we got a really good lyric, you know, pretty good lyric. And, uh, and, and we got a chord progression that was a little bit more um, frog than what I had done. And, uh, and so, I'm, cause Richie loves, you know, he loves Genesis and yes, and all of these prog rap bands. So I do too, but I, you know, that's not usually, I mean, I, it influences me, but I don't really go full on, on it. But yeah. with that one, he, we did, you know, he, 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 we came out with this stuff and I did a demo and I sent it to him. I did I actually recorded the demo live with Joe and, and the rest of the bands, Joe, Mike Forn Fornatel, uh, Sizon Griffin on drums and David Hirschberg on bass. And, and so we did that and, and I sent it to Richie and he goes, ah, I got an, some other ideas, you know? So he said, I, I, I'm really busy right now. I'm slammed with stuff. I got to do my, my live stream. I don't know if you remember, he was doing a weekly live stream during the COVID. Mm -hmm. God, it was insane. So he was doing that. He was, you know, and he was doing this bangy thing. And, you know, he's, he had blue oyster cult commitments. He said, but I, I, you know, I'll get to it in two weeks. I go, Oh, Richie, man, we're going to, into the studio on Saturday. This is like on Wednesday and we're practicing tomorrow. He said, ah, well, I'll see what I can do. Half an hour. Well, you know, 40 minutes later, he sent me a demo and it's like, whoa, this is it. This is it. So we next day at practice, I taught it to the band and then we went in, we, we cut it live. We did it the last thing because the other songs we'd practiced a lot. And uh, before we went, as you do when you go into the studio, you don't want to be wasting time. So we got five songs down. And I said, let's do that Mountain of Madness. And they're like, oh, my God. OK. I said, we got an hour and a half. We did the other songs in 40 minutes each. So, <laughs> you know, we got an hour and a half. We can do it. <laughs> and nationals. Yeah, it took us about seven takes. And the seventh take was it. It was the one. So, yeah. Yeah, so that came out great, and uh, and the other song that Sandy didn't like, I turned into Ariana of Earth because that was the other missing link, the other loose end. That because in the first Maginos record was a song, well, it never <laughs> never made it to the record for Blue Eyes to Call, but it was called Girl That Love Made Blind, and you know, I uh, they put out one of the fans. I I think I know who did it, but. I had given him uh, rough mixes of of the original Magnus record, and so that was on there. The girl that loved me blind, and it got out into the internet, and uh, people love that song. You're like, oh, you got to do that song. So I did it on Reimaginos. I redid it. You know, the 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 original version is still out there on the internet somewhere, and and actually the tapes are somewhere in San Francisco. But uh, I know where they are, actually. I've, I found out that this guy uh, had, had called me and said, I have the tapes, you know, we'll, we'll digitize them for you when you're ready for it. And so that, that I may still end up redoing that original Imaginous record. But cut to back to uh, Girl That Loved Me Blind, in the song and in the story, she... Be, Frank, imagine how shows Frankenstein, instead of bringing a dead person back to life, how about just making a live person live forever? So that was the world without end drug. So originally, Girl That Let My Blind and Siege and Investiture were the same song. Okay, they were one song. And then we decided to split it up into the romantic part versus the Frankenstein part where you know, and and the Frankenstein part was the beginning instead of the in Sandy's song was the end. But he made Frankenstein the beginning because the idea is he goes to he's trying to find his way in the world. And, you know, the the, the voodoo uh, 
the voodoo people that he meets in New Orleans. They tell him go to go to Europe and find Dr. Frankenstein. He's going to show you what you you know what you can do. So he goes to Frankenstein and he said and after some experiments he says no this is not what you should do you should come up with something to make people live forever find some substance that they can ingest that will make them live forever and so there's a, a party of astronomers you know this whole this whole thing came to him in a dream right so there's a party of astronomers and they want to go to Aldebaran but it's too far to go even if if they can find a way to propel themselves it's too far to go for a human being, I mean, to go and come back, I mean, it, even if you could attain the speed of light, it's still 65 years to get there. 65 light years away is Aldebaran. Okay, it's the, our, the closest star to Earth. So uh, they decide that they're going to give her, you know, uh, you know, this eternal life, and they're going to put her in a, a space module, and they're going to send her off you know using magnetic mirrors was is part of this the story the magnetic mirrors sh shoot her into into space and she goes to aldebaran when she's got internal life so i thought i wanted to bring her back to earth so that's ariana of earth we we created that song we used the song that sandy rejected to to put this tie this other piece together so Ariana showed up in half lifetime. So, and it, because he's still thinking about the girl that loved my blind and you know how she's she's saved from from this uh devastation that has been caused by the mirror. So, uh, yeah, so so that that's the other one that, you know, another two original songs out of one idea. Love it. Love it. And just really quickly, folks, we're going to take a break here on All Over the Place. I want to send a shout out to our sponsor, Yasmin McGee, our promo and print specialist with XYZ Promotions. Yasmin McGee, make sure you check that out at XYZpromotions.com. XYZ, all your printing needs from A to XYZ. Christine, I know uh, since we're in sponsors, we're taking a quick little break here sponsor wise. I know uh, I also wanted to get to you because we had a, uh, a fan. Fan question yeah. for you, Albert, and uh, I'm going to hand over to Christine right now because she uh, she's the one who fielded this one. Yeah, absolutely. Friend of the show, Anya Loka, she asked a question. Um, given that uh, Blue Easter Cult is such a seasoned band, how do you feel about the technological advances in the music industry through the years? Most importantly, the use of AI currently, everybody's talking about it, right, um, to produce music. Mm, well, to be frank, I think that there is a lot of things in music that are tedious. You know, the actual writing of a song is a whole other thing. I don't believe AI could ever, ever uh, channel the things that make up the the things that in the, you know the all of the trauma and stuff that that. Uh, uh, humans experience you know that we do to each other to ourselves or whatever you know no ai is going to do that consciously so i don't think that that could ever but there are things that you know like tuning vocals or, or aligning time and lining you know there's a lot of you know editing things you know animation i mean the 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 idea of using AI AI for animation is just mind boggling. If you can draw some figures and then animate them with anim and with the AI, or even just drawing things with AI, you know, I mean, it's really I think a, it can be an incredible tool. So I am not really afraid of it. I'm not. I don't think it's going to replace humans, but it make might make some of those jobs that are tedious a little easier. You know. So, yeah, that's how I feel about AI. I think it's great. And, you know, as far as modern music, I, I'm i not really crazy about a lot of it. You know, the, there are certain artists that I, I really like. I like Taylor Swift. You know, she's great, you know. And then there's then there's the, uh, what do you call it, hyper pop. Hyper, is it hyper pop? 
Is that the word? You, you got me on that. I know K-pop. Like Bella Parcher. Uh-huh. Yeah, you got a 12-year-old. Can you help us out on this one? <laughs> uh, I'm not familiar with hyperpop. Just uh, I know there's about 10 different flavors of pop music these days, all of which I can't stand. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. Pro- that is probably one of them. It's the one that's it's, it's like EDM or you know it's it's very in like electronic pop. Really yeah. high voice, high vocals all the time, and it's like oh my god, it's you know it's weird. It's like it's like uh, Skrillex, you know, and uh, that dubstep stuff. You know, when I first heard Skrillex, I'm like, whoa, this is amazing. But then after a while, it's like oh my god, okay, I can't, I can't. <laughs> Another Skrillex really, song, really yep. effing annoying. <laughs> Dead mouse take five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. that goes back to the AI issue because I mean, if you've already got so much auto tune and so much electronic tweaking to everything, you know, you're not really hearing anything. At some point, you're not hearing anything authentic from some of the a lot of these bands. So well, for them, AI is really just a, just another step in that direction. I guess I think that you know the T Pain effect is is you know it's what it is. I think that a lot of older artists use it just to uh, to smooth things out, and you know you don't. I mean, I think there's probably very little music that is made without auto tune, whether it's Taylor Swift or, or anybody. But if you use it responsibly, you don't like tune every single little thing, and and when you're singing. The best singers, they they don't always sing every note. You know, they they put some personality. They put the you know some some of their drama into it. You know, so you know it, it's if you can create a vocal that resonates with people and it's a little out of tune, and you can tune that one note, then then you should go with it. I mean, it, it, a lot of times, you know, you say, oh. Auto, you know, tuning is terrible, but you know we've always since <clears throat> since they started recording, they would have a tuning a way to tune things up. I mean, the the easiest way back in the day, back when they were cutting records on lathes, was do it again, do it again, do it again until it's right, you know. And so you do that, but then you some sometimes I find recording and i found this for many years now for decades that sometimes that very first take is the best one even though it has flaws so if you can preserve that and still make it a little you know you can preserve the feeling of that and still make it listenable because if you have a really out of tune note it's like you know so if you can take that out and preserve the rest of that beautiful thing that you did you know then uh it's worth it to do it you know so auto tune is great you know and not auto tune to being able to tune a vocal is a great asset you know because now you can take those vocals you would have thrown them away years ago and it but they're valuable they they had a good something good about them you know i'm very very much into the first take so first or second takes they- rock and roll what's that first or second takes that's rock and roll yeah it's true. Amen. It's true. I'm sorry. I mean to step on you there, Christine. Go ahead. That's it's- all right. We're both just so excited. So um, I have a question for you, Albert. Now yeah. that yeah. Imaginos is complete, this culmination of all this work that you've done for years, what's next? Well, the very next thing, well, the first thing that's going to happen is I'm doing some live shows. I've done some in the past, but I'm going to do more live shows uh, uh, at the end of this month and, and next month. And uh, then after that, we uh, following closely on the heels of that, we have the, the Reimaginers comic book, which is the first of three comic books. And those are going to be amazing. I've been working with uh, the record company that they're doing it. And also this incredible fan, a uh, young lady who's a, a really talented artist. And so she has taken all of Sandy's papers and she is going through them. I mean, obsessively and, and figuring out exactly what he meant about this whole thing. So she is, is helping create this. Um, her name is Zoe or Zoe. Zoe, Umlaut over the E. <laughs> anyway, Zoe Gillen. 
and she is uh so she's helping do this thing with uh with the record company and uh, so it's going to be great there's going to be three issues you know they they're i think they started they just started printing the first first one so it should be available like by uh september so that's the next thing there's the comic books then you know there's also sandy had uh he had uh, in these papers are people that he had uh started working with to make a video game imagine it was video game so if it's popular enough we we'll, we'll we'll do the video game just like he wanted and he also was uh uh i think it, the guy's named david fincher uh he yeah. did a treatment like a 10 page treatment for an imaginos movie so there's that so there's all different media stuff you know now with the writer's strike i don't know what's going to happen but that should be i hopefully they'll resolve that soon oh, so fincher would be the right kind of dark for that absolutely yeah yeah that would you know i i i completely side with the writers i mean they're getting food and not just you know i mean not just those people but like the right the music writers you know the people that songwriters i mean I, my one of my best friends he passed away of covid in and to 2020 but he was already complaining that he, you know he used to make a good living he had 60 top 40 hits he wrote for the 1910 book fruit gum company leslie gore uh, uh, dusty springfield uh Manfred Mann, he, you know, he had a ton of hits and yet his money was going down and down and down because it was less, you know, first the, because he was getting paid most of the money on physical sales. And then you know, all of a sudden there was downloads and streaming and each one of those was like less and less and less. So he was making less and less money. I mean, he was worried that he was not going to have enough money to live, but he didn't know that he wasn't going to live that long, but. You know, so he ended up he had plenty of money but whatever it still i could see the writing on the wall and now with streaming it's even less you know so um yeah the writers are not getting uh fairly compensated you know for any of this you know streaming of movies streaming of of, of music any of it you know the musicians have done a little bit better job of of getting money and i i, I can't complain at my my royalties from Blue Oyster Cult are, well, frankly, staggering. But yeah, you know. <laughs> Good work if you can get it, for sure. Yeah. Now, now with, with the tour, I noticed one of your stops is going to be at Daryl's house in New York. Yeah. And uh, so not, if he's, let, let's say, perfect world, I'm not sure if he's there, if he's out doing stuff with Hall & Oates right now or anything, but perfect world, you get to sing some songs with Daryl Hall. Oh, my God. Oh, my Darryl. God. So I, I, I would just harmonize. I mean, he is an amazing singer. I love his voice. Oh, still. I love oh, his God, voice. yes. One of my favorites of all time. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd love him to sing a voice. Blue Oyster Cult song. That would be amazing. Well, that, that, that's where I'm going with this. Like, what, which of his songs, <laughs> or what, which of your songs, which of the BOC or anything off of Imagine's, would you like to hear him take the vocals? Oh, on? I'd love to hear how he'd do Reaper. Ooh. I mean, we crush that song. <laughs> Reaper, yeah. And you're saying you want you want to do you want to do the harmonies with him, but you get to go back and you do a duet with him. Where where, where would you want to go with that one? Mm, mm, mm. Duets, duets. Oh, I don't know. Astronomy I'm maybe. Just blush. Now I've made one really think and ponder hard here. I, I I don't know. Astronomy. You know, I I sing that with my brother and we split up the parts. So maybe that would be something. You know, but if, I mean, I don't know. I think that somebody like that. Then you know, what I found is other artists are like, oh, oh, you know, on the spot they'll do a song that they know, but you know, they might not know astronomy. I mean, you know. He's, you know, I think everybody knows Reaper, you know, yeah. and so that would be the easiest one. Uh, and also, if you look at it, it is a duet. I mean, Don sings a duet with himself, you know, where it's a, come on, baby, don't fear the, you know, take my hand, don't fear, we'll be able to fight, don't fear the, maybe I am man, you know, so it's all. There you go, we, we, we've got to figure it out now. And, and I'm talking, yeah, I, I don't, it's going to be Reaper, what, yeah. What, what Metallica <laughs> did with uh, that, that, uh, that medley that they did yeah. on the, uh, the garage ink with your stuff that that was just oh yeah, yeah. and, uh, well, yeah, and actually, uh, which 
versions of songs through the years. I mean, because Bluish are called this this you know legendary band covers that uh, bands have done. Now, which ones have caught your ear the most over the years? Well, um, Metallica's Astronomy. That's brilliant. That's I think it's great. I mean, you know, uh, when I first heard it, I was a little disappointed because I thought it wasn't heavy enough. <laughs> <laughs> they really saw they were so respectful it was like oh guys just take it take it apart you know do whatever you want to do but you know over the years i love their version I, I i listen to it more than i listen to my own version to be honest so i love that um uh, i love the minute men's take on uh um uh on uh Red and the Black, the Red and the Black, yep. to a great version of that. They they always did. Uh, I love um, what the guys. Oh yeah, they're. I think they're broken up now. But I loved a, a band called Pierce the Veil. Their their Don't Fear the Reaper. It was amazing. It was mind boggling. I mean, it was almost uh, hyper pop. <laughs> it was almost hyper pop. It was so yeah. nuts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. Absolutely loved it. But I also liked, uh, what was it? Lydia Lunch and uh, was it Kurt, Kurt Vile? I don't know. Lydia Lunch did a, a duet with somebody on Don't Fear the Reaper. That was also really great. Really great. Sexy. I mean, you brought her up earlier, Taylor Swift. Which uh, which BOC song would you like to hear, hear her do? <sighs> wow. Uh or, or, or maybe well, you, maybe it would have hard. to be maybe burning for you. That would be good, you know. Maybe change the key to be more, you know, agreeable for her, and and make it acoustic guitar, and yeah, you know, with a with a pedal steel. Beep, wee, beep, wee, beep, wee. You know? <laughs> well, we're on to something again here. I'm I'm digging this. Now uh, you mentioned yeah, you you were you know uh, initially a little bit you know huh with with Metallica not turning astronomy up at all but uh, I've got a music buddy out here and he's uh, he, he's of the mindset that keyboards or organs take a little bit of the oomph a little bit of this you know the mad magic of rock and roll out of songs I say throw on Perfect Strangers by Deep Purple or pick a song from Blue Oyster Cult and just turn it up roll down your windows and turn it up and that takes no oomph out. What say you to keyboards taking out oomph from a song? No, nah, no. Nah. I mean, I'm. Listen, I don't think you know Metallica. Yeah, you know, I. One of my favorite Metallica records is the, the one with the orchestra. I love that S and M. That was oh, fantastic. Michael Keaton, you know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And it t tell me that that made it less powerful. I don't think so. You know. So this is a. This is a. This is not even a worthy argument at all. You know, I, I can't, I mean, I don't know, I guess if you're all into guitar and stuff, but you know, you're back in the last century, <laughs> you know, guitar isn't that important anymore, but I, I still love it. You know, I, I just got a new guitar today. <laughs> well, like I said earlier, mix things up a little bit, have some fun. You might like it, yeah. you might not, but the oomph is not gone when you put keyboards or an yeah. organ. Yeah, so. Deep Purple is a great example deep purple yeah so john lord rest in peace and don airy yeah. glad yeah. Glad he's still yeah. carrying the torch on that stuff so now with the tour like i, I uh, are you going to be performing like how, how much of imaginus is going to be like that that the concept and, and how much well, you're gonna be doing more traditional versions of the songs so we we schedule these shows to uh for to be in early july and yet the record didn't come out until July 7th. So there was not any time to do what we're doing right now, doing any kind of publicity. So uh, it, I played a few shows in upstate New York, a little, my local bar in my hometown. And uh, we played, the first set was all songs from the new record. And I realized, oh, you know, and they were polite. They put up with it but they really wanted to hear don't fear the rear and reaper and you know the one song that got them off was godzilla they love that but you know it's like uh i said you know what i think i it's not fair to the audience to play the things before they've heard them 
you know, play them live. They they have to get they have to know what they're listening to, and then there'll there'll be some anticipation and be like, oh yeah, that'd be great, you know. Oh my God, they're doing this song. That'd be great, you know. They're doing Moth Mothra and Starfish, you know. So I felt like we needed to do uh, we needed to push them back and put out these things. So so that being said. We're supposed to play one set where the headliners on all these song, these uh, things they wanted, and the contract says ninety minutes. Well, Imaginos just the Reimaginos record is like sixty minutes, right? You know, and then the Bombs Over Germany is like seventy minutes, and the you know Mutant Reformation is almost eighty minutes. So, so we're doing as many as we can. But, you know, we're doing about, well, six or seven of each from each record. And I think like 10, 10 from uh, the new record. And it's three hours. Pace yourselves, folks. Just pace yourselves. Yeah. 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 Two, and a, two and a half hours, two hours and 40 minutes. So, yeah, it's a lot. Uh, these songs are long. And, you know, but, you know, then we're try I try and, you know, put it like, like, for instance, Moth and Starfish is only a three minute song. So, you know, we can put that in there and, you know, you get a taste of something really different. I'm also playing uh, keyboards for the first time, really, uh, as a, um, you know, I, I, well, I haven't really ever played keyboards live that much. You know, I think keyboards for that extra oomph, not taking away, yeah. adding. Yeah. It's the oomph. Yeah. Well, I did. I did take lessons for about uh, six years, so I know how to play and I know how to move my hands and stuff. And and really, you know, what I find is, you know, I'm 76 years old, and uh, you know, you get to 76, you got the arthritis. I got a uh, carpal tunnel surgery about two months ago. So, so that I could play, still play guitar because I was having real difficulty and it's helped a lot, but, but playing keyboards is so much easier than any other instrument to me. It's just, oh, I can, you know, it's just, ah, I can actually play, you know, I can play all kinds of stuff on keyboards that I can't play in, on guitar. So, so that's, it's kind of fun. You know, I after I the surgery, I played. Uh, okay, so my family. I have a great family. I love my family so much. We w during COVID, like every year, we would go to my sister's house. She lives in Trumansburg, New York, and you know we're all over the place. My brother, one brother's in Texas, the other guy's in Boston. You know, there's two guys that live up there. Joe lives in Connecticut. I live in New York. We all go to my sister's house for Thanksgiving. Actually, not Thanksgiving, the day after Thanksgiving, Black Friday, because we don't give a hoot about uh, sh shopping and getting bargains. We just, you know, we, it's a good time to get together. The weather isn't too bad up there. And so we would go to my sister's house. And after dinner, because we all play, we pick up our mandolin or our banjo or whatever and our accordion and we make noise, you know and and we so it was great so in 2020 we couldn't do that so we decided well we're going to do a family zoom and we'll all get on the zoom and we'll all be together on the on the computer so we did that and while we're doing that we're like my brother says oh you know i got a song i want to play you know and we we tried to play it all together like we always do you know and it we we couldn't because there's latency you know there's too much latency you know it's the same with uh stream yard you know and this is zoom so it, it was too much latency we couldn't play but my brother said well what about if we zoom everybody but the person who's singing and everybody will play along but you won't you won't you'll only hear the one person and so we tried that and it was like oh this is fun this is almost like being together you know, you don't have quite the interaction, but, you know, we have this making music together. So, uh, so we've been doing that since 2020, like 
once a month or well we don't do it in the summertime because people are too busy but during the you know when it gets colder we do it every month you know we do a family zoom and it's so much fun it's really you know so i don't know where i was going but i'm all over the place here you, you, you <laughs> came to the right spot, spot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, but this is you know my family. Yeah, that, that's, we, a, that's, we an, that's an inadvertent ad for us. Thank you, Albert. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, no, you've got the the dates coming up on the East Coast, and then uh, yeah. I know if I remember correctly, uh, you're going to be doing some dates with the Dictators later this year. Is that correct? Oh yeah, yeah. That's another thing that's coming up. I'm going to Spain with the Dictators. We have uh, eleven shows in twelve days in Spain and then we come back to New York we have another gig in New York a private party so we're going to do that and then I'm going to go back to uh Europe I'm probably going to uh I have a few days off after that one dictator show in New York so I'm I'm thinking about uh because my partner Susie Lorraine she her grandmother was from uh was from Budapest so we're going to go to Budapest for a few days, and then we're going to drive to France to this church where uh, I'm going to record uh, a, a song a song that I co-wrote with a, a heavy metal band in France called Knucklehead. So Dark Country, they call themselves. <laughs> Knucklehead Dark Country. And they are a fan, they're a heavy metal duo, so it's just a drummer and a guitar player. And they are fantastic. I actually played with them last year in uh, in Nice at a, a big festival there. And I just love them. They're, they're wonderful uh, guys and, and a wonderful band, completely unique. The drummer is actually I, I, I like that better than Bouncy Pop or whatever we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Hyper Pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, they're, they're fantastic. They're fantastic. They do, it's very original. And I helped them write their song, and I sang on it, and played uh, cowbell. <laughs> I well, played cowbell. Yeah, I'm gonna write a knucklehead. I got some homework to do on that one, so I'm gonna yeah. check that out for yeah. sure. And you're, yeah. you're, uh, then once 24 rolls around, uh, you're gonna be uh, doing some more dates, possibly Midwest. And, oh yeah. And when, when oh yeah. I'm gonna having you out here on, on uh, the West Coast. Definitely. I mean, I, we we for the my solo thing they want to hear imaginos in the uk and on the west coast they want to hear it that's i just got a thing today come to tulsa you know and and every day i get people from florida when are you going to come down to florida you know and, you know so uh uh i don't know you know i i know that i was uh my uh my best friend in college lives in nogales arizona and he plays with like three different bands and he says send me a list of songs and we will back you up and we'll play in, in Nogales and, and uh, Tucson. So, uh, so I might be doing that. Hey, so, we'll, we'll, we'll make the trip. Oh, are you, are you there? Where are you there? Well, well we're, we're in Phoenix. Oh, in so Phoenix. Hours down to Tucson. We'll, we'll see you there. Oh my God. So, uh, so how is it being inside all the time? <laughs> well, like you in winter. I, I, I'm a baseball oh, no. player, so you know the winters are not so bad anymore uh, around here. Well, Last I, year I, we got like a dusting of snow. I, that was it. I, I'd like to say the summers here aren't so bad, but we're going through what our uh, feels like our uh, twenty. Chuck got uh, fifty. It's getting but, up there, yeah. Uh, heat advice, extreme heat advisory, but you know it's, I'm a baseball umpire, so I've got to go out and it's hopefully a oh my god program for me. And you got to wear all that equipment. Uh, that's where the weight loss comes in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it's all water. You got to get dehydrated. Well, that's the thing. I, mean, I, I lose about seven to 10 pounds of water weight every game. Then I go out, I eat a pizza afterwards. It's, it's a vicious cycle. I bring yeah, it on myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Drink a drink a case of beer and you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll neither deny nor confirm my, my, uh, my liquid habits. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Phoenix! But I know, okay. I know. Well, look, God I bless know. you. Well, with the imagery and the songs, the lyrics, all that that you know that you guys have done through the years, whether it's Sandy or you and you and just uh, all that, I'm looking forward to the graphic novels. And I know Jim, Jim is a big graphic novels guy, and uh, and uh, that, uh -huh. 
Jim, anything uh, on, on that note that uh, you, you've got for Albert? That, uh... well, I'm definitely curious to check out the the uh, Imagine Us graphic novels that are coming out. Uh, yeah. I'm glad I glad I was able to dip back in and hear about the the w- the work inspired by Mountains of Madness because that's one of my all time favorite stories, and I will seek wow. out anything related to that. And I am still frustrated that Guillermo del Toro never made the the movie adaptation he was planning to make uh, 10, 20 years ago, uh, which I think would have been amazing. So uh, definitely going to be seeking that out when it comes out. Um, I'm up in Seattle, by the way. So anytime you want to come up here and do a gig, we could really use some, oh. some good rock up here. Uh, I, I got to yeah. say music has really deteriorated here in the last 20 oh, years no. or so since I moved here. So uh, yeah, I'd uh, love, love to see you up here, but uh, yeah. well, and, and since you brought it up, um, I, uh, I would be, I, you've probably been asked about this about a million times, but, uh, it's probably my only chance to talk to a member of Blue Oyster Cult. So, uh, I have to ask about that, that, uh, that iconic Saturday Night Live sketch. And, uh, <clears throat> I know you have a vlog called More Cowbell. So obviously you've, you've embraced that fully. Uh, yeah, but, no, uh, even more. <laughs> it's even called more. Most Cowbell. Most you've Cowbell. You've heard of More you Cowbell. This is Most Cowbell. <laughs> taking it to the to turn it up to 11 <laughs> yeah, um, <exactly. laughs> but uh just you know I just, I just have to ask if, if did they kind of let you guys in on that get your input on it and what was what was it like getting to, to see that for the first time oh i you know it it blew my mind it was so funny i couldn't stop laughing i had to watch it over again you know, we had it on DVR and I kept playing it over and over. And I was like, oh, my God, that was so funny. How did he even hear the cowbell? You know, uh, I found out later Will Ferrell wrote the whole thing. It was his idea. And uh, and somehow maybe, you know, they had remastered it and maybe it came out louder. I know when they, they were mixing it, I was telling Shelly Yakis, who was the mixer, I said, Shelly, can you turn that cowbell down a little bit more? And he's going, Albert, if I turn it down anymore, you're not going to hear it. I said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> and Don, Don, Buck Dharma said, it's fine. It's Albert, it's fine. Shelly, leave it like that. This, We got this mix. This is great. And, and you know, it was a great mix. So, uh, but, and David Lucas, I, you know, I remember saying to him, why do you want me to play a cowbell on here? You know, uh, and he, he, because it started, I wanted to play a, a, we had a trumpet part. Randy Brecker played a trumpet part. It was a fine trumpet part. It was played by a fine trumpeter, Randy Brecker, famous guy. And, uh, but there was already a guitar solo there. And we were like, why is he doing the horny thing when there's this amazing Buck Dharma guitar solo? So we made him erase the track. So now there's an empty track in the middle. I said, what I'd like to hear is when it goes boom, 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 ding, with, uh, with the triangle. So that was my idea. I wanted to, every time it would hit that cymbal crash, I would augment it with a little triangle hit. And David said, oh, that would probably work. But you got to play cowbell in the verses. I'm like, what? cowbell why is it is this track not steady enough he goes no it's plenty steady but it's all do, 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 do. i want to hear bump 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 i want to hear some more quarter notes on there he said it's all eighth notes you know it's too much the bass is going do, 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 and the guitars go do, 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 do. you know so he wanted eighth notes and it is the only thing on the track that is playing i mean not eight notes quarter notes he, it's the only thing that's playing quarter notes. The bass drum is not. The bass drum is a boop, boom, 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 boom. So I guess there was something to it, you know. I mean, the, the, it had served a function, and I had to be grateful to David Lucas that, you know, he he thought of this idea, and and uh, and I got to be the the lucky guy to play it. <laughs> uh, Percussionist compromises are never done. I'll do this for you, but you got to do this for me. Yep, exactly. Well, and, and now now the cowbell cat, and, and, and you know it's it's out of the bag now. But uh, what are some of your other favorite cowbell songs? I'll, I'll just give you. I, there's so many. I'm a big fan of the Beastie Boys and Hey Ladies and the cowbell on that one. That's my favorite. Other wow. use of cowbell. What what are some of yours, Albert? Well, 
I think the the my absolute favorite is uh, Grazing in the Grass, Hugh Masekela. Oh, yeah. okay, it wow. Instrumental, yeah, it was an instrumental back in the psychedelic era, and Hugh Masekela was the a trumpet player. Was well, still is. He's still, you know, I don't know if he still lives in South Africa, but uh, his his uh, his sister was big in uh, and uh, a big person too. She ran for office and she helped get Mandela out of prison. So, yeah, he's an amazing guy, Hugh Masekela. And he came to Los Angeles and got work. He played uh, on the Birds uh, uh, Rock and Roll Star, which was a kind of uh, ironic, you know, this weird trumpet part on, uh, you know, this song that was about rock and roll, you know. But it was great. It was great. And uh, I got to see him a, a few years ago, and he was great. But he he had he – had, created this track and afterwards he said you know what i think i need a cowbell on this and so they said well go out and play what you did and so he gets out there and there's this big old cowbell mounted on a block and he takes a couple of sticks and he goes diddle, 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 diddle. the whole song diddle, diddle, diddle. it's just like incredible it's like whoa that is that is most cowbell right there <laughs> so but it, it works for me i think that it, it makes the track you know grazing in the grass and I'm just glad our, our other co-host, who unfortunately isn't with us now, Marty, uh, thanks to him, I am familiar. I actually know who Hugh Masekela is, thanks to an album that his father had. So I, wow. I, I followed along on that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> and I, I am actually, uh, for our, our uh, alumni parties, I'm a Penn State grad, and we have uh, Cowbell every time we score a touchdown. So I'll, I'll, throw yeah. on, I'll throw a little of your direction on that one the next time I next time right. score a touchdown. I'll be thinking of you, Albert. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, so uh, for the fans who want to catch the tour, uh, the dates come up at the end of this month and begin in September and uh, on the East Coast. And for the future dates, uh, is there a website where people can go and check you out or go go to just go to Most Cowbell? Or how can people? I, well, you- I, I, uh, Most Cowbell, I don't really. It's really just uh, me rambling on, <laughs> you know, all over the place. <laughs> you know, I like to do. I just uh, go into a digression, you know, for you know, and then you know, you know, at the end of ten minutes, I come back to my point. You know, I'm pretty good at that, but uh, not always. It's getting harder as I get older. <laughs> but but so, and what was I saying? Uh, <laughs> website. How can people find you? The website albertbouchard.net that's that's my website and uh i do update it every every month or so and if i get, get dates are always in there so i stick those dates in whenever i get them well i'm going to keep my eye on that and I, I encourage all of our all over the place listeners just and in the meantime check out and you can get it on vinyl you can get it on cd definitely check it out on your streaming services I, i've been listening on spotify Thank so you. i get that vinyl in my hands and uh, yeah, there you go. Nice. That's why <laughs> gets the big producer bucks right there. So yeah, ch- check out the Imaginos, uh, the Mutant Reformation. That's part three. And then check out all the other ones. And Albert, I was got some other solo albums on there as well. So check that out. Keep your eyes open for the tour in your neck of the woods. And thank you, Jim, Christine, as always, thanks for us uh, helping, helping steer the ship here. And Albert, thanks so much for joining us here on All Over the Place. Great having you. Thank you. Thank you. All over the place, where the fun sanity never ends. Bam! Hi, everybody. This is Albert Bouchard from Blue Oyster Cult, and you are listening to All Over the Place Podcast, where fun sanity never ends.